that to you, Houdat Nation, and welcome in as free agency has now begun. So your New Orleans Saints, the entire NFC South and the rest of the league are going crazy, signing everybody, signing anybody, signing your mama, signing your daddy, and signing, well, a lot, a lot of folks, including the New Orleans Saints, picking up Willie Gay from the Kansas City Chiefs. We'll talk about that. Talk about Jameis Winston heading off to Cleveland. Lonnie Johnson heading off and New Orleans meeting with one of the premier names of the defensive end, talent board, Chase Young. All that and more in today's episode. If you're not excited, well, at least the Pelicans are like 15 games above 500. So there's something to be excited about, even if you're the most negative person in our little framework here. But that's okay. We accept you how you are. But let me give some shout out to those who were here early. We love to reward and to call out and to give love to those who are here live Tuesdays and Thursday nights here for the show. Mr. Jerry Gundam, LGP42. Remember, the answer to life is 42. The Antonio Saints Garcia can be DJ Twigger, Rainey, Jermaine Rollins, Demetrius James, Carlson Jean, and everybody else, especially those who were in the Discord earlier because it's having a lot of fun to talk about everything that has happened so far. Everything that is happening is all because it's time, baby. It's time for free agency. And a lot of big signings have happened that maybe kind of shock you a little bit. Mike Evans signing a two-year, $52 million deal with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. That's $26 million a year. For those of you who did not pass first grade math, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of cheddar. Tampa Bay signing a big one. Not only that, they signed Baker Mayfield to three years, $100 million, $30 million guaranteed, max of 115. Very nice. So we're seeing a lot of movement. New Orleans making a, I don't want to word it as in an insulting way, but a budget move by picking up linebacker Willie Gay Jr. But it's actually a move I really like. He's been a rotational player for the Kansas City Chiefs for four years now. He's young, has an amazingly just beautiful RAS score, and played 62% of the snaps last year for Kansas City, but looking to become more of a full-time starter. So if New Orleans is hoping to move more to a base format, or even if they don't trust maybe the future of what they have in Warner slash Davis, they're getting a guy who is ascending for what I would say is a very team-friendly deal. $3 million one year with a max of five, a lot of those escalators can be based on things like playing time and statistics achieved. So if you're New Orleans, got to be pretty excited about that. At least I am. Demario Davis, two-year extension to push his cap a little bit and also add, of course, one of those phantom years. And then Honey Badger doing the same thing. And like I said, Honey Badger coming, in, uh, coming into this process was the 13th highest paid safety. And if you look around the league, you're already seeing other safeties getting big tags. In fact, Antoine Winfield Jr., got the non-exclusive franchise tag from Tampa. So that already puts him above what Honey Badger would be making. So all these moves and more, pretty big to talk about. Now, if you're talking about who the New Orleans Saints have lost, well, Lonnie Johnson is a big one. He was one that I felt like was a very good rotational player in the Saints linebacker, I'm sorry, cornerback room. I felt like he did a really good job. That's probably one that makes me go, ah, I, I hate that we lost him. And then another one is losing Malcolm Roach, who goes and joins with the Denver Broncos for a two-year, $8 million deal. And I'll be honest, I think he deserves the $8 million. I think that he has worked hard to be that guy, and that's a borderline rotational starter type of a contract. But New Orleans is letting one of their better rotational guys go, and I hate to see it, but I also understand it. You also are losing Zach Bond to the Philadelphia Eagles, who are going to bring him in for one year and – I bet you see Zach Bond get four or five sacks this season, like easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Now with the Philadelphia Eagles, former Philadelphia Eagles cornerback Avante Maddox is visiting with the New Orleans Saints, though no contract has been announced, nor is there one uh, set in stone. That visit was announced yesterday, Monday, March 11th. And as far as things like today, James Winston did ink a deal with the Cleveland Browns for $8.7 million to back up Sean Watson, I would be very shocked to not see Jameis Winston starting games this upcoming year for Cleveland. And then the big name, Chase Young. New Orleans is hosting Chase Young, who's also going to be visiting multiple teams this upcoming, uh, well, this week, the next few days. Go with the Panthers, go to visit the Saints, and the third team that I'm, I'm blanking, I think the Titans 
are also meeting with Chase Young. This is after Daniel Hunter just signed with the Houston Texans on a monster $49 million deal with $48 million of that guaranteed. Talk about some crazy guaranteed numbers. So all of these things happening all in the past 48 hours. It's one of the most fun times of the offseason because you have so much happening in such a short space. Mike says, shout out to the Manese basketball team. Sure. Shout out to them. Apparently they, they're doing well, 28 to 3. So shout out to them. I do want to give a shout out to my Pels because if you're going to be a sports fan of Louisiana, you got to support our Pelicans, who, by the way, the other night put it down dirty. But they did it about they're at 39 and 25 right now as we're getting closer and closer to the end of the season. They're only about what a dozen or so games left. The most recent game was against Atlanta. Anytime we take down any Atlanta team makes me happy. So shout out to them beating the brakes off Atlanta. And it was a break beating. I mean, that they 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 even went as far as to uh, have the starters playing at the very end of the fourth quarter, which is very nice. And then the next game you're going to see the Pelicans, if you're trying to keep up, is going to be tomorrow against Cleveland. So shout out to the Pels, who I feel like are a fantastic defensive team. Like you normally look at this team and you go, wow, there's going to be a lot of like offensive juggernaut. But well, Zion's only averaging 22 points, but their defense is really really good but speaking of defense that's kind of the point of bringing in willie gay i did say on twitter some of the basics of willie gay where number one i love that he is a when i use the word value i'm not trying to say that he is a below average player but he's a guy that's an ascending player who's been playing behind other starters but last year career 62 percent with the kansas city chiefs last year he's a sure tackler love his speed versatile he's played will he's played mike for them, but more importantly, he's also shown an ability to drop back in coverage and be pretty decent in that. Did not give up a passing touchdown last year when targeted and a 76 quarterback rating when targeted. Fun facts, if you want to know his athletic profile, because he was only drafted, what, four years ago. Now, he scored a 9.7 RAS, which is an elite RAS, obviously. 4.46 40-yard dash with a 1.5 40-yard or 10-yard split, rather. Maxing out at 22 miles per hour there. Pretty impressive. Broad jump of 11 feet. Like, that's one of the best broad jumps ever recorded. It's over 11 feet for a linebacker. It was a 9.99 in the RAS uh, column. Uh, that, that's, that's really impressive. And then vertical jump right under 40 inches, 39.5. This three cone in a little over seven seconds. So, this is a very athletic player while also being a kind of prototypical size. I mean, he's a little short, a little over 6'1", but he's 240. I mean, he is a big, fast linebacker. Just doesn't have the same... Oh, McNeese. That's who you're trying to say, McNeese. Okay, shout out to McNeese. We know them. But that man said Benese. I'm like, I don't know if that's like a local high school or what, but McNeese. We do know them, so shout out to McNeese. But that is a fantastic profile that we've seen the New Orleans Saints gravitate to before and I think that we'll see them gravitate towards that in the future as long as Dennis Allen is here we kind of know the prototypes for different positions we know what the defensive end typically looks like which by the way Chase Young does fit that profile being 6'5 265 and this is a guy that was defensive rookie of the year a few years ago he's made a pro bowl and then last year between San Francisco and the commanders I think he had a solid year he had seven and a half sacks but he's not really had the big pop-off moments and the B, uh, the reason being is he had two years where not really playing football. So in terms of fitting the New Orleans Saints mold, well, damn it, we're fitting it even better now because 2021 and 2022, he played a combined 12 games. And that obviously is problematic if you're looking at it from a team standpoint of I need to be able to get value from a starter. Now, whether you look at him as a rotational guy coming in, if New Orleans does pick him up, because by the way, he's visiting multiple teams, but I do think that he's going to be in the lower end of the price range. You look at some of these contracts that have happened so far. I do not anticipate him being anywhere near the Daniel Hunter or the Greenyard, who it was funny. The Texans pick up Daniel Hunter and then the Vikings pick up Greenyard. I don't see him coming anywhere near that because the injuries and he doesn't have a single season yet in four years of 10 sacks or more. And that is a pretty big deal. We talk about a lot where, you know, it's a million dollars per sack minimum when you start talking about these guys getting these big contracts, but he doesn't have that, right? That That's not something that he's been able to obtain. So as a whole, 
I think that the New Orleans Saints are in a good position to try and find their future DN. The question is just going to be how long does it take to find that? Do they find it in the draft? Do they find it in free agency? Whichever direction they go, they do have to address it, right? And you do see different signings happening. For example, uh, the Buffalo Bills re-signed A.J. Epeniza for a two-year, $20 million deal. $10 million a year for a starting caliber edge guy is really not that bad in today's you know, economy as far as edge rushers and, and things like that. You also had what, Josh Uche signed a one-year deal with uh, the New England Patriots. So you look around, there's not a ton of big-name deals coming out. There's not a ton of huge money. So for New Orleans, I think that puts a good spot. You even see veterans like Z Smith, who signed a two-year, $23.5 million deal. So basically, what, $11 million a year for him with the Cleveland Browns while they also picked up Jameis Winston. You, you even go further to some of the bigger names. You're just not seeing monster contracts with edge rushers right now where you can argue Daniil Hunter is the biggest one that's happened so far, at least the one that I've been following. And that's good if you're New Orleans because you do need to find that contract. Now, there is an exception where Chris Jones did sign that monster five-year, $160 million contract. Keep in mind that he is more of an interior player than an edge player. And then you also had Christian Wilkins sign a massive like four-year 110. But in terms of edge rushers, it's actually playing out how you want it to as a Saints fan. Now, also want to throw out that your actual conference, I'm sorry, your division feels like it's gotten a little weaker defensively. Brian Burns is going from the Panthers the New York Giants. For those that missed it, the New York Giants are giving the Panthers a second and fifth round pick, and Burns signs a five-year deal with the New York Giants. So you just took probably the best overall pass rusher in the NFC South. You send him to the NFC East. If you're a Saints fan, that should be a good thing for you. So you took a very scary weapon, and that weapon is now gone. And on paper, and you know, you, you get real scary wording things on paper, but on paper, this looks really, really good for New Orleans in terms of how things are paying out. But let's talk about who all is signed in the NFC South because you do have a new addition at quarterback with Kirk Cousins coming to the Atlanta Falcons, signing a four-year, $180 million deal. I don't want to hear anything else about Derek Carr's contract. I'm telling y'all, man, like, woof. Woof, woof. The hundred million guaranteed. Woof. Fifty million dollar signing bonus. Woof. I'm not even saying Kirk Cousins is a bad quarterback, but Kirk Cousins is not a top five elite game changing quarterback, and he's going towards the end of his career. No offense, Kirk Cousins. Also coming off a big injury. The man's 35 years old. He's not going to come in and just revitalize and be an MVP for Atlanta. Four for one eighty. At 35, anybody that trash talks Derek Carr's contract, look, you can hate Derek Carr as a player all you want, but to say that the New Orleans Saints did not get a good deal for Derek Carr with his contract is just crazy to me when I see things like this happening. Now, other big deals, I actually do like what the Carolina Panthers are doing, even though I don't like their ownership model. So the Falcons so far have brought in Kirk Cousins. They did go sign Darnell Mooney, who we talked about the other night. I wasn't really a fan of him coming to New Orleans, but a three-year, $40 million deal. They re-signed Liam uh, McCullough. But look at what the Panthers are doing. The Panthers are doing the rebuild that many of, you know, many people out there want the Saints to. But they're doing it, in my opinion, the right way. Why do I say they're doing it in the right way? Bringing in veteran of Sean Robinson, a defensive tackle, three years, $22 million. That's a little over $7 million a year. Good value on paper. But look what they did with Robert Hunt and Damian Lewis. Signing Damian Lewis to a four-year, $53 million deal. It's one of the guards. But the biggest guard signing actually goes to Carolina. Five years, $100 million, Robert Hunt coming to Carolina. Now, both of those guys actually end up getting basically the exact same guaranteed money. One has a five-year deal. One has a four-year deal with Hunt getting the better value. They also acquired Deontay Johnson, the wide receiver from the Pittsburgh Steelers. Got Josie Jewell, which is a name some of you might remember or be familiar with, and then Troy Hill. That is uh, some, some nice moves. And let's talk about what Tampa Bay's done so far. They re-signed Levante David for up to $10 million for his one-year deal. Tagged Antoine Winfield. They re-signed their kicker, Chase McLaughlin. 
re-sign Mike Evans, we talked about, and re-sign Baker Mayfield. But I do like the addressing the trenches for the Carolina Panthers. So, here we go. I'm very shocked by some of the moves. For example, Carolina ended up getting less first-round picks than they spent for Burns, Matt, uh, McCaffrey, et cetera, while that they've gotten rid of guys that were, you know, you thought were going to be the building stones around that team. But here we are today. Here we are today. And uh, the NFC South is still wide open up for grabs. Now, normally I would uh, deep dive, but I really want to get the opinion of the chat. We've got Jameis Winston going to Cleveland, which I'll be honest, I want him to be as successful as possible. I want, I want him to be the starter in Cleveland. So I want Deshaun Watson to like, you know, trip over a shoelace and, and, and do something that isn't life-threatening, but gets him off the field. And I want Jameis Winston to, to win the AFC North. I'll just be honest. I do. You can hate me for it. I really don't care. Hate me all you want. That's what I want. I want Jameis Winston to win the AFC North. That means that Lamar Jackson loses. Cool, whatever. That's what I want to happen. Give that... Give that man a shot to just continue to put his face on TV because he's hilarious and just uplifting and kind. And I want success for that man as a person. So I'm rooting for that. As far as the signings by New Orleans, they're doing exactly what we anticipate them doing. They're coming out of the gate and they're saying, hey, we're not necessarily going to go for the biggest guy in terms of big name contracts. Now, they didn't go after Daniil Hunter, but they are going young. Again, Willie Gay is, I think, a great piece to build with, assuming he can be healthy. Chase Young, if they pick him up, Chase Young turns 25 next month. Like, that's a fantastic addition. Willie Gay just turned 26. I mean, this is a team that needed to get younger at key spots, and the people that they're targeting that we see them going after are doing just that. They're keeping the veterans that they say perform very well, even though I... Wanted them to keep Lonnie Johnson. It's funny, Lonnie Johnson actually made a comment uh, on Instagram that he wasn't even asking for as much as what you see Willie Gay get. But Lonnie Johnson's actually going to turn 29. So the New Orleans Saints also seem to be trying to make an, a you know pretty obvious effort to get younger and talented at the same time, which I think is the right move for them as a team. Instead of trying to get veterans you know that might be good veterans, you, you're trying to build for the future as well as get quality. And I like that. We'll see how the Chase Young thing plays out. But I like the move so far. Even though it's slow, this is also how New Orleans runs their game. And it has for a long time. They don't usually come out of the gate and say, hey, we just signed the premier free agent. All of it's done. Here we are. It just doesn't tend to happen. Gundam says Atlanta, major gambling. On Kirk Cousins. Most Achilles injuries are, uh, injuries are difficult to return from. Plus, he's 35 plus. Good luck, ATL. It should also be noted that if you're going to do that, you should probably do that with a very, very, very good offensive line. And I do believe that Atlanta has improved their offensive line. But I would not say that the Atlanta Falcons are an amazing offensive line. I think they're a good offensive line. We'll say this, though. In terms of weapons, you still got to get somebody to run the offense and run it well. See the New Orleans Saints with Pete Carmichael. But you talk about Drake Ludden, uh, London, Kyle Pitts, Bijan Robinson, Tyler Algier. Her cousin's going to have weapons. Like, on paper, the Atlanta Falcons offense should be good. They should. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to sound like I'm bleeding red and black right now, but I'm just being honest. Like, on paper, like, if Matt, when Madden 25 comes out, the Atlanta Falcons offense is going to go off. I promise you, watch it. You go play your games on Madden 25. Watch the Atlanta offense go off. They just are. They have the weapons to be good. It's can that coaching staff elevate Atlanta? And I still am not confident in Atlanta's coaching staff. We'll see. I don't know how confident everybody else is, but we'll see. For those who do not know or, or did not keep up with, and I get it, it's the Falcons. And everybody wants to keep up with the Falcons. But... Head coach is Raheem Morris. Offensive coordinator is Zach Robinson. So they have definitely done similar to what New Orleans has done, which is trying to reinvigorate by addressing several different things. Zach Robinson is a pretty big name, right? It's a name that a lot of Saints fans talked about coming from the Los Angeles Rams. So 
we could see the Atlanta Falcons offense return. The only thing is the defense for Atlanta might be taking a fall off, and that's where they hope Raheem Morris can provide for the team. But I will say this, Atlanta has made the moves that I would say they need to make to put themselves back in contention to be legitimate threats to win the division. So saying that in March is what it is, but I will say that right now, Atlanta is my team to watch if you're an NFC South watcher because slowly putting together the pieces. And even though I don't believe Kirk Cousins is a Super Bowl winning quarterback or an MVP quarterback, when you surround him with weapons and you build a modern offense, it could be dangerous, could be gnarly. We'll have to see if the Dennis Allens can slow that down. Let's see. Spaces, I would trust Raheem Morris before Dennis Allen. None of our coaches are proven winners. Well, by that regard, I wouldn't really call Raheem Morris a proven winner, but I guess it depends on what you classify as a proven winner. And I'm not even saying that like in a trash talky way, right? Because Raheem Morris's career starting or career head coaching record is 35%. With both teams, by the way. Like he's coached two different teams. Atlanta, he was already the coach for Atlanta back in 2020. But he's also with Tampa Bay 2009 to 2011. So he had a 10-year gap, but he was the same coach then that he was when he got a shot at 2020 when he had to fill in. Now, the fill-in season, hard to really count, so we'll, we'll give him a, a little bit of grace. But with New Orleans, Dennis Allen's been a 47% winning coach, which is nothing to be bragging about. But I wouldn't exactly call Raheem Morris, say, an established winner and then dunk on Dennis Allen. I think that everybody in the NFC South has got a lot of questions, including New Orleans, including Atlanta, but they also have a lot of potential. So we'll see how that plays out. But I'm not going to just say that Raheem Morris is just objectively as good or better than DA when DA, even though I don't like DA as a head coach, like I do not believe DA takes New Orleans Saints to the Super Bowl. He's a better performing coach in the past decade than Raheem Morris. Take that for what it is. It's just a a statistical objective fact. We'll see if that continues this year. Neither of them are what I would call current premier coaches in the league. But that's why you hope you build a good coaching staff, which is why I felt the need to mention a name like Zach Robinson for the Atlanta Falcons. Because just like Clint Kubiak coming to New Orleans, Zach Robinson going to Atlanta, both can either really pop off and create some great modern offense, or they can both flub out. We'll see. Personally, I think that you have a better shot of success with Clint Kubiak because there's more experience and you're coming from years and years of, you know, well-defined trees. Whereas Zach Robinson is a little bit newer on the streets, a little bit more of an unknown, but doesn't mean that he's not potentially as capable. Both of these coaches, Raheem Morris and Dennis Allen are going to live or die by how well their new offensive coordinators can rise their teams up or raise their teams up, right? I feel like Dennis Allen's going to have a top 10 defense. I feel like he's adding players to make that happen, right? I feel like Raheem Morris could probably do similar. I don't think Raheem Morris is as good of a coach in terms of defensive talent that DA is, but I still feel like make something happen. I'm very curious to see if New Orleans goes with a guy like Avante Maddox and bring him in. Uh, the big thing with Avante Maddox is he's still relatively young, but he's obviously not had a lot of playing time the past two years, but he wouldn't need to be a starter. You seem to be keeping Lattimore. You've got Taylor. You've got the one and only Paul Sandibo. Still fine there. We'll see what they do to address safety. So, very curious to see where all this moves. Gunham says, if Dennis Allen can draft or acquire an apex predator edge rusher, it's a wrap. Saints will be cooking. I do want to point out that the New Orleans Saints did officially release Marcus May today, and that means that the New Orleans Saints have got a hole that has to be plugged by somebody. Somebody's got to, to, to fill that spot, right? There is now a void at a starting position. And whether you believe that May was good or not, which I don't believe that May was performing at a high level, you still have to find a way to address that. You've got to find a starter. Antoine Winfield, again, getting tagged by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, you look around the league, we've already had big safety signings happen. Xavier McKinney signed a four-year, $68 million deal with the Green Bay Packers. So uh, Kevin Bayard and Jonathan Owens both signed with the Chicago Bears. Uh, Who else did we have? Uh, Jeremy Chin signed a little $4 million deal with the Commanders, which I didn't want him to New Orleans, but that is a, a price tag that I would love to have. 
You had what Aloe Gilman re-signed with the Chargers because I've, I've been trying to track safeties because I believe the Saints are going to need one. I'm trying to think of anybody else. Uh, Brandon Jones signed a three-year deal with Denver, but he's a real low end on the totem pole type of a guy. Uh, Darnell Savage signed a three-year deal with Jacksonville. Um, who else? Oh, and the one that I wanted, Geno Stone. Two years since he. And $15 million deal, by the way. I would have taken that in a heartbeat. New Orleans has got to find a spot. And I'll be honest, the safety market has dried up pretty quickly. Pretty quickly. So we'll see what New Orleans decides to do with that because I feel like that's a, a big need at the moment to get somebody to be that center fielder. And that doesn't mean that I don't like Howden. I do. But same thing I said about E.T. Perry, I'll say about Howden. You do not trust a guy who looked good in limited snaps to be a starter. You provide some level of competition there. And if he wins and if he's the best, you go for it, right? Absolutely fine with that. But you definitely don't just sit there and say, hey, the man looked good in some snaps. Let's see what happens. You don't roll the dice like that. Um, I think the New Orleans Saints need to address that position again. But I really do hope Alden gets an opportunity to be the starter and he shows up and shines out. So we'll see what's going to happen. Demetrius says a safety over offensive line in the first is an L in my opinion. I guess it depends on the safety and what grades you have. Right? I think... Offensive and defensive line are much safer picks. And in the long run, I would probably say better picks because generally offensive linemen have longer careers. And if you get a high-end one, they play at a high level longer. At the same time, this New Orleans Saints defense with um, Dennis Allen, the entire time it's been here when it's been good has been good because of DB play. No offense to the defensive line. We've had some really good players at D-line. But the reason that this team has been good is because DA is a DB type of a guy. He's relied on good corner play and good safety play, especially safeties who could do multiple roles because we've run a quarters match system. We've run Tampa two. We've run cover three and cover three match. And we've changed things up over the years. And it was all predicated on having guys in the back end who could do really well in varied coverage formats. So while I do agree that the New Orleans Saints have got to get a good pass rusher, I also look at this as a very scary hole because Dennis Allen's system is not built around the front seven as much as it is the back seven. And it's just the style of how he creates his team. And you do reach a point where as good as a coach might be, if the talent he has isn't high-end talent, you're not going to get high-end play. Now, I'm not saying that in any way to down Howden. I'm simply saying that there's an unknown now that has to get addressed. And... However they address it, whether free agency, whether the draft, I want there to be competition for Marcus May's spot. And I hope Howden wins because for those who don't remember how Howden played last year, I'll pull up the stats for you so that it doesn't feel like I'm just trying to trash on a guy who was a rookie last year. He will be turning 24 this offseason. Shout out to him. Let me give you his numbers. So last year, Jordan Howden did the following. Uh, we're going to go with um, starts. He did start seven games technically. Only gave up a 59% completion percentage when targeted. Quarterback rating of 99, though. No interceptions. And he did give up touchdowns. And he did give up over 170 yards through the air. Now, these aren't terrible numbers. I thought he did well in limited reps. But there's certainly not enough there to make you go, hey, that's your starter of the future. Certainly something that you can build on and build with. But you also would like to have a little bit of competition there. For reference, by the way, for those curious what Marcus May did, Marcus May, who only played seven games, 77% completion percentage given up when targeted. That's a little bit scary. And then um, the man, the myth, the legend himself, 67 QB rating, because he didn't give up touchdowns. He did give up a lot of completions, but he shut them down quickly. How do you know that? Well, the number of air yards that he gave up is less than half of what Jordan Howden did, even though they started the same amount of games. So, Howden, I think, has a lot of upside, but you've got to see that actually translate to on-the-field play. So again, I just want a little bit of competition there. I'm curious to see if maybe the New Orleans Saints move up to, say, draft a guy in the second or third that they feel like can contribute. Now, I'm always a big fan of trading back, but you know how the New Orleans Saints and Mickey Loomis run. For those curious of the New Orleans Saints draft picks, here are the official draft picks for New Orleans. They have a first-rounder, pick 14, Second rounder, pick 45. This was via the Denver Broncos. Then they have 
four fifth round picks, 149, 167, 169, 174. They have two sixth round picks, 189, 198, and then a seventh rounder. So they have got seven day three picks, but only two picks in the top 50 and only two picks in the top 148. I mean, if you want to count that fifth rounder at 150 or 149, sure. But would like to see the New Orleans Saints get somebody in the third, see how they can maybe package a trade up. But they do have a lot of picks. They have nine draft picks, but most of those are coming late day three. Late day three. So whether it's straight up in the third or the fourth, do expect New Orleans to make some type of a move. Really be surprised if they don't. NTR actually says it wouldn't be surprised after the Saints moved up the third or fourth round to draft a safety. I think that's a completely viable strategy, but I would add that drafting a skill position player in round three or round four, unlikely to have a guy who's day one starter ready. Certainly can happen, but doubtful to have one that's day one starter ready at that point. So if we could lose a 45 and get a few fifth rounders away, get him in the second, that'd be cool. I don't know how much I'm willing to give up. Again, I think the big thing that I want to see for the New Orleans Saints personally is I want to see the Saints go for quantity as much as quality. But not that I want to like abandon the quality argument, but I think that the thing that New Orleans needs is to get younger. And the thing that you want to prove that your scouting department is good, which I think they are. I know they've gotten a lot of flack this uh, past few years, but I think they are. I think Dennis Allen, with his desire to just find this defensive end, is kind of blamed for that. But I feel like you have a very good scouting department. Let them cook. You give them more opportunities to find guys that fit your team, well, then the odds are that you're going to look better. I don't think it's a coincidence that if you go to the Saints draft history, the drafts with the most picks, like numerically, are the ones that everybody likes the most. And the ones that have the least amount are the ones everybody dumps on, right? Everybody trashes the 2022 because you got two people out of it. You got Alave and Taylor. Pinning has not panned out. You only drafted five people that year. So when a failure happens, it's more obvious. Whereas comparatively, look at 2017. Sure, you've got the big names, but everybody in 2017, every single one of them, ended up being a player in the league. All of them. Not a single person. All the way to sixth round. But look at 2015. Nobody says the 2015 draft was terrible. But you had a lot of quote unquote misses there, but you drafted like 10 people. So it's okay. You got Honors Pete, who was a pro bowler many years. You got Stefan Anthony, that was a miss. Holoi Kikaha worked until the injury kicked back in. But PJ Williams was a long time rotational guy and starter for the team. I think PJ Williams played what, like 90 games. I mean, for a guy that you picked in the third round, that's good. Good. And then Tyler Davison, defensive tackle. He hasn't been with New Orleans his entire career. He was still in the league last year. He's played like 120 games. I think he has the most games played out of all the Saints 2015 draft picks. So I think quantity is a big thing that New Orleans has to get to. Actually getting numbers and having success by hitting as many on the dartboard as you can. That doesn't mean that if you draft 10 guys in the seventh round, you're making a great team. But I do think that the scouting department needs to have an opportunity to bring as many good names in as they count. And I'll be honest, TJ, I think that Elante Taylor counts as a hit based on where he was drafted. If he was a first rounder, I wouldn't call Elante Taylor a hit. But being a guy who was drafted in the second round at pick 49, by the way, which is what the Saints have again this year, pick 49. Well, they got pick 45, so very close. I would say that's a good pick, right? Trevor Penning didn't work out, but... That's how it goes. But then it was really easy for everything to fall off because you only drafted DeMarco Jackson and Jordan Jackson after that. Jordan Jackson has never played an NFL snap. And DeMarco Jackson so far is just a career backup. And we'll see if he develops into anything because this will be his third year in the league. This will be his third year. If he's, you know, even anything around the league, it'll be his third year. And he's with, what, Denver? Because Denver loves picking up our scraps right now. Oh, no, he's still with us. No, no, he, he's still with us. We have passed a lot of people on over to Denver, but he's still with us. So we'll see. You think they could move Penning to guard? I still don't agree with the whole Penning to guard thing. I never have. I probably never will. Um, I just When a guy has fundamental technique issues, moving him to guard does not do anything to help him. 
And if you have a guy that has the potential to be elite, you'd rather have an elite tackle than an elite guard. Moving him to guard doesn't make his job easier, nor does it help him in any way. I understand why people argue that it does, but I don't believe that it does. Putting him in a phone booth at guard does not magically take away problems. He is technically flawed. And until he fixes those issues, moving him to guard just means he's going to get beat by premier three techs instead of premier edge rushers. And you just got to hope that somehow, some way, he gets developed into a quality player. Again, year three, same thing that happened with Cesar Ruiz. I said, give him three years. Third year, he popped off, had a really good year. He was solid last year. We'll see if Trevor Penny can do the same thing. Has he lived up to a first-round draft pick? Absolutely not. He's not lived up to the first round at all. But, but, third year is the year that we try to judge all draft picks. I don't try to judge him on year one and two. Judge him on year three. Another great example besides Cesar Ruiz is Paul Sinadiba. And I'm not calling anybody in our chat out. I promise I'm not. But after Paul Sinadiba's second year where he was dealing with injuries and stuff, a lot of people in my podcast and in Houdat Nation were calling for Paul Sinadiba's head saying that he should be benched and gotten rid of. Just trash him. He's gone. The first year was a fluke. That was legitimate arguments being made. And I'm not calling anybody out specifically. But after his first year where he looked really good, his second year he had injury issues he was dealing with. He just did not look good on the field. People were calling for him to be trashed. And then last year he was arguably, if we're including availability in the argument, he was your best corner last year. Now, obviously when Lattimore is healthy playing at a high level, he's the best. Paul Sadebo was your best, most reliable corner last year. Third year, it matters. And Alante Taylor deserves the same level because a lot of people hated on Alante Taylor last year because they moved him over to nickel and then he got benched at nickel twice. But when they benched him, they just moved him outside and he played well outside. So I think you got two young guys there. Alante Taylor about to have his third year. So we'll see how that plays out. And if the New Orleans Saints, because you know the whole thing with Alante Taylor was you know he's talented, you wanted to get him on the field. And it did not work out his first year in nickel. But that's also why I like that conversation about Lattimore. You can have it because you know Alante Taylor's much better on the boundary than he is inside. His first year didn't go super well, but I don't think it was terrible. It didn't go super well. We'll see what they do this offseason with Taylor. But year three, again, you got to let guys develop. Gunnar says hoping Foskey can put in uh, put it all together some potential. He does. And uh, hopefully the NFL weight room Helps him out here this past offseason. He comes in. I'd like to see him a little bit stronger. And when I say stronger, I if we talk about what I'm looking for from Isaiah Foskey, I know he's 6'5", 265, but you look at his build compared to Chase Young. Chase Young and him are like listed the exact same weight. But you go watch Chase Young tape and look at Chase Young's strength. Very different than Isaiah Foskey. I want to see Foskey have more functional play strength on the field. I want to see him widen out that frame and be functionally better at the point of attack than he was you know, coming into camp and last year on the field. We'll see. Now, that, now keep in mind that I don't believe that Chase Young's a polished product either. One thing that Cameron Jordan has given, or one person that Cameron Jordan has given a lot of love to over the years is their pass rush specialist. Like he has given every year he talks about like who's helped this team and all this other stuff. But one of the names that he consistently brings up is Brian Young. And Brian Young has been with this team for what seven years now. Through all the changes everywhere, one thing Brian Young has stayed right here. They like Brian Young. And if somebody's going to develop pass rushers, which I think, personal opinion, New Orleans has done a good job developing pass rushers. Now, I'm not trying to take anything away from Ryan Ryan Nielsen, but I do think that Brian Young has been a very, very good coach for them at what he's supposed to be doing. He's been with the team, believe it or not, all the way back from 2009. He was an intern then. But since 2011, he has been a defensive assistant slash linebacker assistant focusing on pass rush. And I feel like he has done a really good job at bringing them that next level so you got to hope that he can do that with everybody else right we'll see 
Everything else that you have, I love the move so far. I love the Saints picking up Willie Gray. I like meeting Chase Young because I think the value is there and you don't need an immediate starter because you have Cameron Jordan, you have Carl Granderson, but if you could get a rotation, a litany of threats, well, that makes it better and, and easier for everybody. All these things seem to point to a good thing for the Saints, and that doesn't even account for Peyton Turner, if he can ever get healthy, the amount of potential that he has to contribute to this football team. And Tony says, is this Peyton Turner contract year? Could he still be the answer? Could he? Absolutely. Absolutely. Peyton Turner could be the, the answer. He's entering into his fourth year. So technically, he could have a fifth-year option. I don't see the Saints picking it up. This man would have to go absolutely ridiculous. Number one, he'd have to play 17 games. I'm not being a hater when I say this, but consider this me challenging my inner Dr. Billy Yoshi, one of our regulars here on the show. In three seasons, he's played 15 games. In three seasons, he's played 15 games. So unless he pops off, comes and plays 17 games, and then puts up like eight, 10 sacks, this is a contract year for him. I don't see them giving him the fifth-year option. He has to actually come in and just blow the walls off it's going to be really tough because he's got a lot of people ahead of him. At the same time, you give him an opportunity. You give him an opportunity to be healthy, to contribute, and if he doesn't, then he doesn't. And it'll just be another failed example of the defensive end that Dennis Allen has wanted so bad, just not working out. NTR says the best you can hope for with Foskey is a T-Rex third-year ascension. I've given up on Turner. If we don't, if we draft edge, maybe a verse, Latu, Roswell, Robinson, or Trice. So I haven't given up on Peyton Turner only because he only played two games last year and was injured. So I'm kind of technically counting his fourth year as his third year. But if he doesn't show it this year, yeah, I too am done with the the Peyton Turner bandwagon. And that's not meant to be a hater. It's just being honest. Paul says Cameron Jordan is not a starter anymore because the production is not there. Strong disagree. It depends on what exactly you're referring to. Cameron Jordan, for better or worse, And I'm not saying that Cameron Jordan is an elite player, but context is always important. I do think that he's still elite at some things, but let me give you something. One, I'm not even going to worry about him playing through injury last year, which he did, because I believe if you're on the field, we're not going to make excuses for you. That said, do you know who had the most hurries last year? The Saints defensive line. Cameron Jordan. He had the most hurries. He had the second most pressures. Pressures are combining hurries and sacks, et cetera. He had the second most pressure total along the defensive line. Now, Cameron or Carl Granderson has the most, but that's because he had eight and a half sacks. But if you're talking about just pressuring the quarterback, Cameron Jordan actually had the most on the team. Now, I think that that points to a bigger problem, which is that the New Orleans Saints need to get more talent along edge. I'm not arguing that Cameron Jordan is still his elite self. Cameron Jordan is still a very good player. He's still elite as a run defender, and he's good rushing the passer. I think what would be great is if you had brought in younger elite pass rushers to take over that third down role and just have Cameron Jordan there the first couple downs. I think that's completely fine. You just transition into what he is at this point in his career. Find ways to use him situationally. But I don't think that he's no longer a starter because there's nobody on this roster that can play defensive end full-time better than Cameron Jordan. I just, I believe that. There's nobody that can play his position better. Should you be looking for that person? Absolutely, you should. There's nobody. And I would argue there's not really anybody in the NFC South I would take to replace him right now. Like his specific strong side position, if I am weighing pass rush, run defense, et cetera, equally. Now, there are some good players in this division. But I think that, we get too enamored with sacks, and I do agree that sacks are important. But I think that he's better than he's getting credit for. And I don't think that he's just fallen off the wagon. There's a reason that he led the team in pressures, even though he did not lead the team in sacks. He had his you know worst season since his rookie year in sacks. He lost his own NFL record for the most straight years, getting seven and a half sacks. But I think that, He's still a good player for this team. So 
Kendall says, Peyton Turner has not shown any flashes of greatness. Chase Young can be a situational pass rusher. If we can get Maddox, then we can focus on offense in the draft. Only thing is, I don't, I understand that you love depth, but I don't really think that Maddox comes in and is game changing, except that he's probably comes in as immediately the best nickel corner. My only question is, if you bring in Maddox to start nickel, what are we doing with Elante Taylor? No offense, Elante Taylor. I love you. What are we doing with Elante Taylor? Because you're bringing in an older player with an injury history who would probably take his spot. Now, I don't want to just play Elante Taylor for the sake of playing him, but you can't have three outside corners. There's only two outside spots. Alante Taylor's not going to pass up Paulson to Debo. And if you keep Lattimore, well, Alante Taylor ain't taking his spot either. So what do you end up doing with Alante Taylor? That's my only question with Maddox. Like the whole reason that Alante Taylor played nickel is because he was one of your best players and you wanted to get him on the field. Like the goal is you put your best 11 players on the field. Well, Alante Taylor's one of your best 11 players. Well, but if you, if you sign Maddox, then what are you doing? Now you've only got two options. One, ride the pine. Or two, try to move him to safety. So a third position change in three years and hope that works out. And I don't believe that he'd make a great free safety moving into year three. So we'll see. Again, none of this is meant to be like a trash talk. I'm just very curious what the New Orleans Saints vision is. And maybe they're willing to, you know, speak more on it here in the, Maybe a reporter will ask about it. We'll see. I'm very curious about that. You think that Chase Young would make a one-year deal? I would love to see him take a one-year deal. I know his group doesn't want that, but I will say this, and we mentioned this earlier in the show. If you look around the league right now, that's what most edge rushers are settling for, one-year deals. One-year deals. Well, look, y'all, I've had a great time. I hope you enjoyed the show. We're going to be back Thursday because there's going to be a lot more news. And even while we were covering right now during the show, More stuff's popping off, right? So we'll be back Thursday. We'll talk about it. We'll see what the New Orleans Saints do. And no more comments for you. Hopefully, a little bit of discussion from the coaching staff. Who that? God bless. Appreciate every single one of y'all. Join the Discord if you haven't already. And thank you for supporting the channel by watching. Like the video. Share the podcast out with your friends and family. We'll catch you Thursday night. Deuces. That's me.